Hi, I'm Dr. John Thompson, president and founder of Extract Lab. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about top 10 reasons ethanol extraction is better than CO2. Get ready for this one. Let's get started. So here are the top 10 arguments against CO2 extraction. Number 10, low solvent power. Number nine, long cycle times. Number eight, low throughput. Number seven, it's not safe because CO2 processes a high pressure. Number six, CO2 is not scalable. Number five, CO2 equipment is not reliable. Number four, CO2 needs ethanol for winterization. Number three, solvent residuals are no big deal. Number two, CO2 equipment is too costly. Number one, CO2 is too costly. All right, so what we're gonna be doing in the next 10 slides is we're gonna be going through each one of these arguments and busting them. So we'll start with number 10, CO2 has low solvent power. Uh, this one may have some credibility. Listen, ethanol has the solvent power. There's no question about that. If anybody's ever drunk a scotch, okay, it will dissolve your tongue. The great thing about ethanol is it will dissolve everything. Basically, it'll dissolve pesticides. It dissolves undesirable plant materials, waxes, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons uh, as you roll it over your carbon. It'll dissolve terpenes and any other millions of organic substances. So ethanol does have the solvent power and it's much more stronger than CO2, no question about it. Uh, ethanol's uh, not the perfect key, however, for the cannabinoid lock, okay? It's more like the universal key for every organic lock, okay? So that the whole key analogy is more of a selectivity thing than it is a solvent power thing. That's why you need to talk to, you know, separation scientists like myself, because we know about selectivity. Okay, so CO2 has the selectivity, and the way you really talk about selectivity is you talk about it in terms of pressure and temperature. So solvent strength for CO2 is highly dependent upon the pressure. That's what's so awesome about it. Um, the solvent power and the CO2 goes away as the pressure is released, leaving nothing but pure oil. CO2 has adequate solvent power at elevated pressures, uh, 5,000 PSI at 50 degrees to extract 90% cannabinoids in about an hour. So who cares if it has a greater solvent power if you're getting the job done? I think it's kind of a red herring actually. A low pressure and low temperature, CO2 has less solvent power compared to high pressure. And it's used selectively to extract terpenes in terpene-rich mixtures. So actually, you can use that selectivity to really make uh, like terpene soup sauces and things like that. So actually, that's pretty cool. You can't do that with uh, ethanol. And uh, temperature, pressure, and co-solvent are tuned in practice to make CO2 more selective. So that's what we do. So CO2 really has that selectivity and ethanol has that solvent power. Sometimes you can combine the two. Ever since we started making our equipment in 2015, we've always had a like a solvent pump on our system for, you know, like cold solvent. So if you want to add a little bit of solvent in there to get it to, you know, go faster or to improve the situation, you can add a small amount in and it makes a huge difference. I think this one is plausible. CO2 absolutely does have low lower solvent power compared to ethanol, but I I'd also think that selectivity trumps solvent power. And when you're talking about separations, selectivity is the name of the game. Let's move to number nine. CO2 has long run times. This argument is really predicated on their previous argument that since CO2 has low solvent power, it has long run times. Now, historically, CO2 has been run at low pressures. And in those conditions, yeah, it's really, it's pretty slow. You know, typically run times of four to six hours, for example, depending on your pressure and your temperature. And sometimes actually those methods are quite desirable. So under certain circumstances, you want to have a, like a terpene soup or you want to selectively get the terpenes out. That's a really great way to do it. You can't really do that with ethanol, by the way. So it's not true, however, when pressure and temperatures are elevated. So you can really shorten up the run times. Also, if you run a decarb material, it's also a lot faster. So if you decarb your biomass like we do, we decarb it and we get out all of the beautiful terpenes out ahead of time. So they're not being degraded during extraction. You can uh, basically go even faster. So it, it's actually dependent upon what material you're extracting. And also it's also dependent on what the temperature and pressure is. Just to give a blanket statement that it has long run times isn't really fair. So you really need to think about that. Because ethanol has a very a high solvent you know, power, it, it is pretty fast too. 
so I don't I don't deny that and it makes sense that it is fast um, you know the, the issue with ethanol is you know recovery of that ethanol and then the cost associated with the recoveries and then you know the ethanol loss and really driving up the costs and do a comparison between the ethanol and co2 on the extraction costs but it is misleading to compare the solvent power for two solvents for a given solute without specifying the pressure the temperature and the composition at which the comparison is made yeah it's just not fair you're saying oh well one is uh, much faster than the other well you have to specify the conditions otherwise it's just not fair so number nine i think is busted number eight CO2 extraction is low throughput. Again, this argument goes back to low solvent power and at long run times, therefore, it has a low throughput. You know, we just don't see this bore out in real life. I mean, we three of our 180 machines can process one ton of biomass per day. And they're very small space. They're like 26 square feet per machine. So 75 square feet, probably under right around 240 amps, three phase. You know, it's for low power, low space, very, very inexpensive to run. The CO2 is basically nothing, you know, four cents a pound. So one thing is that you can say that it's low throughput, but, you know, we're running a five ton a day facility in less than 4,000 square feet. That's our, basically our extraction area. Actually, it's a lot less than that. So I, I'm not really sure if it is low throughput. I mean, we're running, of course, uh, higher pressure, higher temperature methods. I don't think anybody in the hemp or cannabis industry would say five tons a day is low throughput. Just, just saying. So throughput is important, but throughput per what is important? Like, for example, throughput per unit cost or throughput per unit operating cost or through, throughput per unit space or throughput per unit facility cost. I mean, you really need to put throughput in context. So throughput's important, but you, throughput per is actually much more important. I put this as busted because you can go look at one of our other YouTube videos where we have a two or a five ton per day facility and we don't, we're running in an F2 uh, facility, which is an F2 occupancy. You don't really have all those problems associated with uh, ethanol and large amounts of solvent around. It's really nice. So let's go on. CO2 at high pressure is not safe. Oh my gosh. CO2 is going to blow up, right? This is what some of the uh, ethanol and actually butane, propane people are saying, which is kind of actually ridiculous. It's kind of almost dumb. I don't know of any catastrophic event that's happened with CO2 extraction equipment. I don't, I don't think it's ever been reported. There may be, um, you know, injuries of people getting their fingers hurt or like a fitting going off or something like that. But I, I don't know of any physical, you know, where someone catastrophically like they died or a plant like blew up or a fire burned something down. I, this just doesn't happen with CO2. So, and it's not only our company, but there are a, a lot of other CO2 companies and it's used industrially. So, you know, certainly there's lots and lots and lots of people who have used CO2 and, uh, you know, the equipment itself is quite safe. There has been issues of uh, asphyxiation with people who have left the CO2 run and then they suffocated. That has happened, uh, but not in our industry. It's happened in other people's industries. So you can go to OSHA and you can look at all those things. And there have been some instances of those. Yeah, you have to make sure that your CO2 is safe. So, you know, you can use alarms, you can put them on, and we have alarms on all of our equipment. You know, if if you get a leak or something like that, and you don't know the leak is happening, your machine will basically shut off. So that's one thing. And, you know, our CO2 cages, which are basically our CO2, you know, conditioning equipment, those things have a vent right on them with a contact closure. If something happens, if the if the CO2 goes up above, uh, you know, a, like a 5,000 ppm, you know, the fan turns on, it vents it. So that's pretty nice. But anyway, um, butane, propane, ethanol, you know, even ethanol has uh, caused fires in this industry. And they're pretty well known. You don't have to go very far in the literature to see issues with butane and propane as well. So... Um, I think that there are safe ways, obviously, to do all these techniques. Um, and so really, we're talking about the exception versus the rule. But it's kind of ridiculous to say that 
it's not safe to have uh, CO2 at high pressure. That's ridiculous. I have a pressure washer at home and it is 5,000 PSI pressure washer and my kids use it. It's, it's not a problem. Just the fact that you have 5,000 PSI does not make it unsafe. So that's ridiculous. So I say it's busted. Okay, let's move on to number six. CO2 is not scalable. This is absolutely not the case. I mean, I can show you pictures of a five ton per day facility. There are many large industrial CO2 extraction facilities all over the place. Um, large scale uh, CO2 extraction is very old. It's very well known. It's safe. In terms of scalability, when you think about that in terms of a facility, you want to make sure your facility is scalable so that, you know, basically you can start off at a low volume and then increase uh, your production capability without having a, a, a tremendous uh, upfront cost. So that's what scalability is. I consider that to be more of a, a facilities characteristic. In our case, you know, we have, we made our system so they're modular, you know, like uh, you need, if you want to do like a half a ton a day, you can use one of our 180s approximately, a little less than half a ton a day, or, you know, like 500 pounds, something like that. If you want to do uh, a ton a day, you can, um, you know, take and add another couple of those units. It, actually, as you increase your uh, biomass, you're increasing your output, you're getting more profit can afford more equipment. So, you know, the way we typically design facilities is so that you can scale it up over time. And so that's a really great way to think about scalability. But CO2 is absolutely scalable. You don't need to have huge, huge, huge vessels to scale up. I mean, we're using, you know, 40 and 80 liter vessels. Those are not huge vessels um, and um, or vessel volume rather. And yeah, they're just not huge. So actually they're, um, they're all at, uh, you know, chest level like this and you can, uh, you know, put in the biomass in there. It's really not, it, you don't need huge vessels. So I don't know where that came from. Um, two or a five ton today facility. You can tell me whether or not it's scalable or not. That's what I recommend, but I have to put this one as busted. It is. CO2 is definitely one of the more scalable techniques that's on the market. Number five, CO2 equipment is not reliable. Well, I have to say that, you know, in the last, say, three years, I think that all the manufacturers have really upped their game on reliability. I'd say maybe four or five years ago, you know, a lot of the manufacturers were using like Haskell pumps and, you know, they weren't really made for, you know, the cycle duty that they were applying them to. So a lot of people had to have like extra pumps sitting on the shelf. I don't think that that's the case anymore. A lot of the pumps are pretty reliable and the pump that we have is extremely reliable. Yeah, I mean, we have been running, you know, 24 hours a day for many, many, many years on single pumps uh, and they're pretty reliable pumps. I, I really enjoy them. They're basically they're piston pumps. Um, they're actually diaphragm pumps, excuse me and uh, you have a diaphragm, it's a PTFE diaphragm. Uh, the fluid comes in uh, through a check valve and then exits through a check valve. They're really, really reliable. The other items that you could say are not reliable, uh, maybe are the seals. You need to change out the seals. And th if those are done on a maintenance schedule, you know, like once every three months, you shouldn't have a problem. So I wouldn't say that CO2 equipment is not reliable. There are some people who start with cylinders, just single cylinders of CO2. And then they try to run an operation and they're always running out of CO2. And that's not the way to run a CO2 extraction operation. Okay, so that also is one of the ideas that might make you think that it's unreliable because you're always running out of solvent. Like you're always running out of CO2, small, the cylinders. We have a product called the CO2 cage and we recommend that you use the CO2 cage because you can get it filled, for example, from a beverage truck or a large bulk source. It conditions all the fluid, delivers it to your extractor, and it's quite nice because it's always going to keep it at the right pressure, always at the right temperature. And yeah, it's just a preconditioning, a piece of equipment. So we've taken CO2 tech to the next level. And I think the whole industry has basically kind of, kind of stepped up the plate on that. I don't really have any fingers to point at any of our CO2 competitors, really. We've really dialed in reliability. I think that that's the case. I also think that 
the like the pumps that are being used the low pressure pumps with uh, ethanol i mean those are pretty unreliable too they have issues we've used a lot of those like cent centrifugal pumps or metering pumps they got problems and so i don't think it's a really a universal thing like oh hey your co2 equipment is not reliable and ethanol equipment is reliable i think that mechanical systems have problems period so that's something to think about so i would have to say this one's busted co2 extraction needs ethanol oh my gosh yeah, well, this one's plausible. It's absolutely true. If you're gonna do some CO2 extraction at a large scale, you're probably gonna be want, running some sort of winterization process. Now, with an ethanol extraction process, they, they kind of run winterization within the process. So you're running winterization no matter what, but with CO2, you have a, it's almost like a separate process. You get the oil out and then you winterize it. Okay, now, the deal here is that CO2 does this winterization process, but the ethanol usage is way, way, way less, way less. I mean, it's not even close. So it's really not on the same level. So you don't, don't really need to worry about, for example, having to lower your costs of solvent loss or solvent reuse or any, or even the power. You don't have to worry about those, those costs really, because you're using so little of it. Food grade ethanol, you can use that even though it's more expensive and it's not going to be really, you know, contributing a large uh, portion of your cost. And ethanol reuse is still subject to the FDA GMP practice for change out validation specification requirements. So um, the bottom line is I have no problem with ethanol uh, or food grade or organic. It's just we use it for winterization. I just don't like denatured ethanol. I think that's a really bad idea. So I have to say that this particular one is plausible. Yeah, CO2 does need extraction. Yep, CO2 does need ethanol to make it work. What I'm really, I'm really sure is a big so what? I mean, CO2 uses a lot less ethanol, like a lot. So it's not the same, even in the same category as ethanol extraction in terms of its ethanol usage. So it's a big so what? All right, let's talk about number three. Solvent residuals are no big deal. I totally disagree. And everybody knows that I disagree. The butane and propane people had been talking about this. They say if you have a properly purged solvent, uh, properly purged oil, it shouldn't be a big deal. The issue is that a lot of people didn't quite get that process down. And so there were widespread knowledge of uh, residuals in a lot of the, you know, for example, shatter. I don't think butane and actually propane is that big of a deal to eat. Pretty non-toxic. Non but when you start talking about denaturants that are added in to ethanol, that I really have a big problem with that because you know we see samples that pass like tests, the solvent test, the four or six nine USP test, for example, and you know they still have heptane or they still have acetone or they still have you know different denaturants in them. There are no long-term toxicity or carcinogenity studies on many of those solvents in the class three, which is ones I just mentioned. And so they know that they're less toxic, but they only know that from the short term. Like for example, if you look up heptane, this is a good example. People are adding heptane to ethanol um, to denaturize it. Okay, there's a 5,000 ppm limit on heptane, but the FDA has basically said that they don't have the data for long-term toxicity or carcinogenity for heptane. That's a problem. And they cited one single study and they said, okay, it's okay at 5,000 ppm. Well, I just don't like that. So residual chemical solvent impurities are entirely avoidable using CO2 production methods. That's absolutely true. So why take the risk with solvent residuals um, they kind of are a big deal because there's a lot of unknown potential consequences from them. And a lot of it hasn't been studied. Cognitive function, effects on cognitive function, effects on endocrine disruption in the endocrine system. There are a list of all these areas of science that we have basically uncovered and know a lot about since 1981. And we have a pretty antiquated limit on heptane, for example, basically on the basis of our known amount that's in there. So I have to put this one at busted. Solvent residuals are a big deal. 
and you know you can entirely avoid them just using co2 production methods so i say busted let's go to number two co2 equipment costs too much well i have to say you get what you pay for co2 equipment is definitely more expensive but the trade-off for that is that co2 equipment also has the lowest operating cost period co2 operations will generate cash faster thereby paying the needed increase in equipment cost and driving value for business for years. So one thing, if you really look at the numbers and you look at the operating costs and not just the initial equipment costs, you're gonna come up to a very different conclusion when it comes to the added cost upfront for CO2. We offer extreme value in use. In other words, as you use our product and the way we use it with CO2, and the CO2 cost itself is so extremely low if you look at that in that sense, our products are ridiculously inexpensive. Just do the numbers and you'll know what I'm talking about. So I'd have to say that this is busted. And now for the number one argument that ethanol is better, CO2 extraction costs more than ethanol. That's just absolutely not true. Take a look at these facts. Number one, CO2 uses four to six times less power than ethanol extraction. We don't have to take and you know, evaporate huge amounts of ethanol that's a big power cost so co2 wins liquid co2 is four cents a pound as compared to ethanol which is four dollars and 71 cents a pound that's 117 x less cost that really drives a huge impact on if you have ethanol losses that's going to cost you a lot if you're going to try to do organic you have got to buy organic ethanol and that's going to cost you even more so loss of uh, CO2 per day is about 211 bucks for one ton a day compared to ethanol, which anywhere is from 4,000 to $7,800 a day. Easy, depending on what kind of ethanol you buy. CO2 is the liquid startup cost is about 211, whereas the ethanol startup cost is anywhere from 7,000 to 15,000. So it's less. CO2, if you're gonna build a building, say 5,000 square feet, CO2 is housed in an F2 versus an H2 occupancy. Those costs are published by third party all over the world. 68 bucks a square foot, typically average cost versus two over $200 a square foot for H2 occupancy buildings. So extraction facilities are less costly and CO2 extraction facilities have low cost insurance compared to ethanol. Absolutely true. My advice to you is don't mortgage your company's future value by operating a high cost operation. You need those profits to grow. So the number one argument I think is busted. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, we have many resources available for you to get your hemp operation up and running. Calculators, advanced extraction guides, distillation guides, CBD jam sessions. We have just lots of content. Uh, links to which are in the description below, as well as the cards up and above. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what was your favorite part of the video? If you would let me know in the comments below, I'd be really appreciative of it. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more content like this. This has been Dr. John with Extract Lab. Thank you and have a great day.